Tate Chronicles now transmitting. Welcome to the Tate Chronicles on Healthcare Now Radio. And now, here's your host, Jim Tate. Good day, citizens of the free world from border to border, coast to coast, and to all the ships at sea. I bring you a warm welcome. This is your correspondent, Jim Tate, and thank you for tuning in today to the Tate Chronicles. Join me as we cut through the fog that exists at the leading edge of healthcare, technology, compliance, and regulation. I'm really pleased today my guest is Todd Searles. Todd is the Vice President for Business Development for Caravan Health. He has over 20 years' experience serving healthcare communities of all sizes. Todd has led both his own and other health IT consulting companies, including a 250-client network of providers. I think I first ran across uh, Todd when he was the director of the Regional Extension uh, Center for, for Nebraska. Todd's known as a recognized leader in understanding the complex issues related to healthcare delivery and the effects of changing regulation. So, Todd, good afternoon and welcome to the show. Thank you, Jim. It's uh, it's great to be here. Really appreciate the uh, the invite, and it's always nice to catch up again after so many years. Yeah, it, it sure is, Todd. Uh, first, I'd like to dig into a little bit about uh, the work that's being done. I, I know you're now at Caravan Health, very focused on providing support to ACOs. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about who Caravan Health's customers are and, and the type of services uh, that that you provide to them? Yeah, you bet. Uh, Caravan Health was, let's see, we were started back in 2014 by a couple of hospital leaders and physicians looking to really take their lessons that they earned the hard way in value-based care arrangements and ACOs and really share them with others, starting first in the rural health space and then taking it all the way up now today into academic medical centers and some of the largest ACOs. Uh, in the nation, right, come to us for managed services. So we've helped more than 250 health systems. I want to say 26,000 clinicians. We make value-based care work, as we say, regardless of their size, the location, the history, or really the demographics. We pride ourselves in the fact that uh, over 50 to 60 percent of our members traditionally have been in the rural or medically underserved space. Um, and we've, you know, we've got results that we believe are second to none in the industry. You know, average scores on MIPS, uh, such as 95% in 2019, more than 50 million in total shared savings in 2019. And then over four years, we've helped save CMS $191 million um, in the Medicare MSSP programs. So, and part of what we do is, is build on the lessons that that again, that we learn the hard way. When you have ACOs first start, a lot of times they read the letter of the law and they say, we can make a 5,000 life ACO work. And we learn that that's just not the case. You run into the tyranny of small numbers where one year that 5,000 life ACO does amazing. And then the next year they don't because two of their patients got sick in a very bad way and it ended up just you know busting the cost curve. Um, so in 2019, we pioneered the largest ACO in the country it has more than 235,000 Medicare lives. And in its first year, that uh, saved $33 million in shared savings for the members. And I think part of why that is and why we've been so successful is that everything that we do is deeply rooted in team-based care. We really believe that the, the physicians should not be um, really burdened with more of this work when you have really good team members that are surrounding them. Nurses and CMAs working to the top of their license can really impact uh, the quality curve and the cost curve in beneficial ways. So we, uh, that's what we do. Uh, you know, we like to say that we're more than population health, but at the same time, it is the core of what we focus on uh, to help organizations really succeed under value-based care. You know, um, I've heard the phrase virtual ACO, and so is that uh, a practice that uh, might want to receive the benefits of an ACO, but maybe not go through all the contractual arrangements to join a formal ACO? What's the story on that, Todd? You know, that's a that's a great question. And I mean, for us, we absolutely make sure that each member 
you know, we the way we organize things is we have principal participants, and that principal participant can be a, you know, a hospital, a health system, it can be an independent physician practice, and then we have sub participants who they sometimes work within their communities, and that's the way we structure them. And then those sub participants work with that principal participant to really take things on. We we don't, you know, the virtual ACO or this kind of virtual concept where you're in but you're not in. Uh, to us, that's, I mean, it's its not the right way to go about the program. We want to make sure that every single member is a stakeholder in the ACO and every single member is invested in their success. And so, for instance, even with those principal participants that reach out to, say, a community provider, be they a specialist, you know, that, that they ended up looking at the data and they realized that uh, the ophthalmologist or the orthopedic surgeon in their area or even a larger primary care practice that they're competing with, you know, was driving the bulk of their patients, their attributed lives, you know, for the patients that are attributed to them and in the ACO. We want to make sure that, that those people get engaged that they're brought into the ACO and that they buy into the team-based approach. We don't want them just dipping their toe in it because as we, you know, as we truly believe, everybody needs to be held accountable, especially as we march towards risk and dual-sided risk. Um, but more than that, we want everyone to benefit right it's uh we don't want just some winners and some losers and some people just riding on the coattails of others um so i i would say just at its at its core you know the virtual aco concept um for us is more about uh, a collaborative aco in which everybody is participating and they're just not kind of dipping their toe in the water gotcha that makes perfect sense todd as we speak we're probably 10 months into the international covid pandemic. And so I would be uh, interested uh, you know, on your thoughts on what effect this has had on the ACOs that, that Caravan Health works with, uh, what type of clarification or guidance that they've looked look to you for to, to supply to them. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it is it is front and center on everybody's mind, not only the administrators who are looking at reduced margins because of, you know, having to close elective surgeries, uh, but the frontline health workers, right, you know, rightfully called heroes who are really suiting up and 24-7 are available to care for uh, members in these communities. And whereas initially, perhaps a lot of our rural communities were spared some of this, and therefore, you know, we, we didn't see it in the 12-bed the critical access hospital community in, say, Montana, like we did in New York City, I think it's safe to say that across the United States, at last count, every single state except for two were increasing their numbers. Here in Nebraska, where I'm based out of, um, the governor just recently implemented a directive that hospitals had to ensure that a certain number of beds were left available just because the amount of COVID admissions are increasing across the state. You know, just down south of us uh, in Kansas, I just read Norton. Kansas had a uh, just a horrible outbreak in a in a nursing home and and so we're seeing it in the rural areas and one of the things that we heard from our clients was a couple things first a lot of a lot of goodwill towards CMS for allowing ACO members to remain in their current risk level for 2021 right so that they weren't faced with an uncertainty because many of them were in what we called track 1 2 or 3 ACOs and those were set to expire this year and CMS said nope in the middle of this public pandemic, we have to give you guys a, a measure of stability and uh, and we'll let you stay one more year in the, that path if you want, because it's what you know. And and many of our members took advantage of that. And and so we think, you know, reducing uncertainty. CMS has really done a lot when COVID first started uh, rearing its ugly head to kind of assuage a lot of the concerns for some of our, our facilities. And then I think as we dug kind of beneath the covers. Now, obviously, Caravan, we stood up a lot of resources. Our physicians went into overdrive, creating educational series, webinars, white papers, things like that to get the most up-to-date, trusted information out and then best practice on how to uh, continue to treat patients because we were not only trying to support the physicians looking for information on COVID-19 
you know, support for, for where they could go for, you know, what can they do and what can't they do in terms of billing, um, but also how to, how to just re retain that good relationship, the patient-physician relationship when we're moving to virtual. And a vast majority of our clients where they had done some virtual visits, none of them, it's safe to say, uh, was it the book of business for them, right? They, they didn't invest in it like they perhaps could have in years past, but they had to. Uh, as we moved into the, the dark days of COVID-19. And what we found was that many were quickly able to pivot to virtual care because they had already implemented team-based care approaches. They, they realized that if they asked their CMA, you know, to send out a, a, an updated appointment reminder, no longer going to bring that patient into the clinic, but the CMA would call the patient and say, hey, look, we've got this virtual platform. Would you like me to walk you through how to use it? Uh, the doctor still really wants to, to work with you. And, uh, and then, you know, they would kind of prep the phone uh, for the physician before that visit. And all of that was built on the trust that was created during team-based care work. Uh, you know, in years past when the physician was doing everything themselves, maybe that wouldn't have been as easy a transition. But with this focus on, you know, ACOs and improving quality, reducing cost, people have had to implement new population health workflows that truly do take advantage of all members of the team. And I think that uh, our clients and other clients in ACOs as well were well primed, I think, to, to make that shift in an easier way than those who you know, they were facing this for the very first time and, and how, to, how, to, how to engage chronically ill patients remotely. And then again, CMS made it even easier when they said you could just do a telephone visit instead of a virtual visit mm -hmm. and, and seek reimbursement. So, so I think in a lot of ways, we were benefited by rules that CMS made. And then looking at some of not only our just fully baked as part of our protocols, team-based care approaches, but then also some investment in new innovation. Caravan had recently acquired a uh, paid patient engagement software, and we very quickly transformed that uh, into a tracking mechanism for some of our clients who were at the time beta testing the product to really run through some simple COVID assessments, just like you would do today if you log into a, any telemedicine visit we were kind of at the cutting edge with our patients with this patient engagement software. Uh, you know, if a patient wanted to speak with their physician, they got a little questionnaire. If they met these things, then, you know, they were able to be triaged and, and treated appropriately. So I do think that as we look at COVID over time, a lot of groups have had to become experts in virtual care very rapidly. And those that were obviously working towards a, a more integrated delivery of care network system, uh, I think we're able to respond faster and better than those that weren't. You know, you, you mentioned the patient engagement software. Uh, one thing that's uh, kind of popped up to me during this explosion of telehealth uh, care delivery, I, I think the next step uh, may well be remote patient monitoring. And uh, just uh, the technology is certainly there, the software is certainly there to, for those folks with chronic diseases, congestive heart failure, diabetes, things like that, that are relatively easy to track with devices that, that we have now. And, and that's reimburse, reimbursable uh, by providers. Do you see that being growth area? Certainly not like telehealth was. Telehealth went through the roof and then, of course, just pulled back to find a more manageable level of, of where it makes sense. What about remote patient monitoring? Do you see that on the horizon? I do, I do. I see it. I see it though as as like you know one one piece of the puzzle, right? Robust chronic care management, no matter what you call it, is critical for Medicare patients. And take it even outside of Medicare, right? If you go into the the commercial space and and you look at patients who are managing multiple conditions, and you know you don't have to be 65 to have a heart problem, as you know. I think unfortunately in America with our diets and things like that, that's just you know chronic diseases. Are occurring earlier, and and getting a hold of those things are not only right and better for the patients earlier in in the diagnosis of those conditions, but then effectively managing those conditions seamlessly throughout the care network. You know, one of the things we stress a lot inside of our ACO is that it is absolutely ACOs are built on the foundation of primary care. But when you look at the data and you look at where patients go, 
perhaps rightfully so, their spending pattern and their visit pattern is sometimes driven by the conditions that they have. You would expect someone who, who has a recent di uh, diagnosis of cancer, for instance, to spend a lot of time in the oncology office and perhaps they're not checking in anymore with their primary care provider. You know, their, their thoughts are elsewhere and they're going to the expert. Same thing with CHF, right? You've got the several different heart conditions and, and so people get to know their cardiologist and then they start going to the cardiologist once a year as opposed to a primary care uh, provider once a year. I think that there are opportunities for those specialists and PCPs to work together and everybody you know, benefits. Obviously, we we talk about robust transitional care management, robust chronic care management, and then moving forward where there's a focus on, uh, you know, the 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 single point of care. It, it's one condition, right? If you have one chronic condition, you'll be able to get paid to track that. And and it's the, all of these things will lead to an improved payment model where physicians feel like the work that they're doing that you know, in the past they may have done with the oh by the ways or a phone call that they'd never get reimbursed for. You know, these are now things that these physicians are going to want to engage their patients either directly or through their extended care teams. And then they're actually going to get reimbursed by private payers and Medicare to do it. And that's going to incentivize everybody to continue in this model, right? If I'm a patient and I've got three conditions and I'm really worried about them and, you know, being properly managed under COVID, if I can set up a 20 minute call a month with my, um, you know, with my primary care practice and they're helping me through it, especially if I've maybe COVID is hitting me with depression, right? That 20 minute call a month with a, a provider just telling me that everything's okay. I mean, it's the best thing you could possibly do for the patient. And now finally the, the reimbursement mechanisms are catching up with that. Well, speaking about uh, reimbursement, of course, on a regular basis, CMS puts out pr proposed uh, new physician fee schedules, uh, and there's time allowed for public comments. And I know Caravan Health recently provided some public comments to the uh, next uh, proposed uh, physician fee schedule. And what are some of the thoughts and concerns that uh, Caravan Health expressed? Yeah, thanks for asking. This is this is a point where where we often get to say all the good things that CMS is doing, and then some of the concerns we have. Not only you know for us as experienced people in this industry, but then also the concerns, uh, elevating the concerns of our members to CMS. You know, I think there are some really good things, right? The extension of some of the telehealth flexibilities. Again, I think our rural members especially love that, and it is something that is transforming care. I think even, you know, the uh, CMS has recognized, you know, the door is open. We're not getting the horses back in the barn on telehealth. So we, we love the fact that they're going to continue that moving forward. Some of the concerns that we have may actually seem counterintuitive on the surface until you really dig in deeper. Like, for instance, CMS is, is um, proposing a, a pretty dramatic reduction in the number of ACO quality measures uh, that ACOs and others would have to report. One of the things that we believe has been a true highlight of the success of ACOs is to take a look at the 23 quality measures that ACOs have to do and see how well and how successful not only our members, but even members and other ACOs have been across the, the, the spectrum. And it really is a distinguishing feature of members in an ACO who are truly all in on multiple preventative uh, measures and, you know, process measures and things like that. I mean, we were looking at the whole gamut of care and we're wanting to raise the bar all the way across the board. And so we feel that if you reduce the number of measures down to a very fixed rate and they end up becoming the same measures as people say in MIPS uh, who are not part of an ACO get a report, you've removed the distinction of just how well ACOs uh, are performing in totality right? You, you've almost narrowed your focus too much to show that the, the impact, the positive impact that ACOs are doing, it, gets, it almost gets lost because you're focused on such a narrow point. So that was one of the things. It was, again, on its surface, you know, who doesn't like the reduction in complexity? But when you are realizing that your shared savings is in large part driven by how well you do, um, anything that would detract away from that 
I think we have just some sort of concern, you know, about. The other thing is they're, they're you know, perhaps in a normal year, this wouldn't be as big of a deal. But one of the things that I, I have to say, there's been a lot of complaints about the web interface and reporting quality measures through the web interface. Um, having worked with it myself, it is it is slow and tedious and things like that. But they're now making a proposal to move that to a new method, and it's you know it's called the the app method and uh, what's that the APM performance pathway. And now instead of submitting quality measures through the web interface, you would use this new APM performance pathway, the app. And again, it seems like a simple change on its surface, but deep down, what it means is just another process change for ACOs and their members during a pandemic. Uh, one more thing to focus on. So I think in the future, most ACOs will be willing, and definitely us at Caravan, we're willing to consider uh, this so sort of a, a, a process, an operational change, but not right now. I mean, COVID is still out there. Let's reduce the number of changes to something that's uh, very manageable and, and makes the most sense. And right now, you know, just how we report quality measures just doesn't seem to be a, you know, a, a primary focus, uh, we believe, or should not be a primary focus. You know, when you mentioned the quality measures, uh, Todd, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but uh, it seems that the ACO quality measures are really focused in two areas, patient experience, data gathered by surveys, and uh, keeping patients uh, out of the hospital. Is that kind of the two focuses of ACO quality measures when it gets down to the uh, You line? know, when it gets down to it, I think, you know, the improvement measures, you know, and then, the um, you know, to look – so yes and no. I, I, I definitely have the cost measures, and the cost measures are inherent to anything with an ACO because if you're keeping people out of an ACO or out of a, I'm sorry, out of a hospital, you're hopefully improving the total cost to the healthcare system. But everything from monitoring falls, for instance, um, depression screening, a diabetic, you know, diabetic screening. We're also looking for those improvement. Um, uh, quality measures. So uh, moving from, uh, you know, process to performance-based measures. And these are the sort of things that we want everyone to know that our members are doing outstanding jobs with. And so I think you can track the, the cost just in and of itself, right? Like in MIPS, there's the cost category. And that's inside of an ACO. That's just baked in because that's where shared savings comes from. That's where your benchmark comes from. Um, so less focus perhaps on cost as a quality measure and more on uh, improvement uh, as, as a, you know, as to the type of measures that we should be looking at and focusing on in, in terms of an ACO. We unbelievably have uh, kind of gone through, uh, it's funny how when you're talking about something interesting and time can fly by, there's a couple more things I want to touch on before we sure. run out of time here, Todd, is one is... Uh, I'm aware that uh, uh, you and I are going to be colleagues soon and that you and Caravan Health are starting a podcast channel. Uh, when is that yeah. going to be happen? Who are you going to be interviewing? What's going to be the focus? Where can it be found? Yeah, thanks. We are we are actually going to do it. You know, we've got great leaders like yourself out there, uh, you know, just killing it on a on a monthly basis. And, and we thought that uh, we've got a story to be told in terms of the influences and the influencers who drive the bottom line of value-based care. And so we're creating a podcast called Healthcare by the Numbers. It's going to be hosted on the Healthcare Now podcast station. And we hope to kick off our first season in mid-November, looking around the second end of the second week in, in November, uh, trying to still nail down the um, you know, the, the, the official launch date at this point, but it is going to be mid-November. And I would say for the latest information on that, you can always go out to caravanhealth.com uh, and, you know, you can sign up for our biweekly newsletter. We're going to be definitely doing a big uh, marketing push around the podcast. Uh, we've already got a few speakers lined up, but really at the end of the day, it is focused on the numbers, but it's not necessarily financial numbers. You know, it could be the numbers of rural hospitals that are facing closing. It could be the number of COVID cases, but these are the things that are driving the success or the failure inside of value-based care uh, amongst facilities across the United States. And we want to dig into what's influencing those numbers. 
You know, um, one thing I want to make sure our listeners can uh, find out about is if they want more information about Caravan Health Services and just want to contact and get some more information, uh, what's the best way that they can reach out? Definitely the caravanhealth.com. And then we've got a contact us uh, link there as well as they can sign up for our, you know, events, articles. Um, and then also just to plug it, put in a shameless plug, December 7th to the 10th, we're also holding our fifth annual Accountable Care Symposium. And this year it's going to be virtual. And we've got some really stellar keynote speakers um, that we encourage you guys to go out and take a look at the list. Um, and you can find more information about the symposium there too. Okay, great. I'd be interested in that myself. I look forward to that. Well, to all our listeners, thanks for joining me on this episode of the Tate Chronicles. I offer a special salute to my guest today, Todd Searles of Caravan Health. Todd, thanks for coming aboard today. Thank you. You can find more information on this show's program page at healthcarenowradio.com. That's also be the location for uh, Todd's upcoming podcast. Until we meet again, here's wishing you smooth sailing and safe harbors. Tate Chronicles transmission ending now.